Uh, thank you very much indeed, Brendan, for that nice introduction. Uh, now, you're probably bracing yourselves for yet more disastrous news. After all, a uh, historian of finance uh, who writes a book like The Ascent of Money, which was written in anticipation of this financial crisis, is entitled not only to say, I told you so, uh, but then to tell you something even worse. Uh, but I'm not going to do that. In fact, I'm going to try and offer you some relatively good news. And relatively is the operative word. Uh, what I'm going to try and do is to relate the financial crisis that we are living through to the wider question of foreign policy. And I want to try and make an argument about the paradoxical implications of a global financial crisis, indeed a crisis of globalization for the power of the United States. If you reflect on it, we are living through the end of an age of leverage, an age of debt, which propelled not only household debt, but also the debt of financial institutions to unprecedented heights. The total debts of the public and private sector uh, in the United States reached a peak of more than 350% of gross domestic product on the, eve, uh, on the eve of this crisis. The United States was reliant on importing $3 billion of foreign capital per business day in order to finance its current account deficit at its peak. This influx of foreign capital, as you know, ladies and gentlemen, financed, among other things, a housing bubble, the bursting of which triggered this extraordinary chain reaction uh, of financial crises. Now the good news. This is not Great Depression 2.0 yet. <laughs> to remind you, gross domestic product in the United States declined at an annual rate of minus 14% between 1929 and 33 on average. The International Monetary Fund anticipates that the US economy will contract by minus 1.6% this year. So far, the Great Depression was roughly an order of magnitude worse. Prices declined at an annual rate of minus 8% during the Great Depression. Right now, the inflation rate, according to the latest numbers, uh, is 0% in the United States. So we are not yet in deflation. Unemployment, as you know, peaked at 25% in the Great Depression. We will be in very bad shape indeed if it rises much above 10% this time around. I know the stock market is down a long way. 55% feels pretty bad, doesn't it? But 86% was the total decline of the US stock market from peak to trough in the Great Depression. So this is not the Great Depression yet. But it clearly, ladies and gentlemen, is a great recession. The collapse of house prices from peak to trough of 25% has plunged around 14 million homeowners into negative equity. Banks on both sides of the Atlantic are in a critical state with projected losses estimated by my friend uh, Nouriel Roubini at NYU at around $1.8 trillion and a total bank capitalization of $1.3 trillion, it is reasonable to suggest that a very large part of the Western banking system is, in fact, insolvent. And that is, it seems to me, a profoundly troubling thought. Not only that, because banks are only a part of the credit system, the system of securitization that had come to provide a larger share of total credit than the banks has completely broken down. The collapse of the issuance of mortgage-backed securities is of the order of 95%. Now, you've probably been struggling, as I have, to keep pace with the new administration's various policy innovations. I will summarize them for you as follows. They are TALF, PIF, ARA, and HASP. Those are the acronyms that I infer from, first, the term asset-backed securities loan facility, which is designed to revive 
the securitization market. That is TALF. The public private investment fund that Secretary Geithner announced to general dismay only the other day, that's PIF. That's supposed to buy at least some of the toxic assets with at least some public funds. Then there's the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, ARA, which is the official name for the stimulus bill, or pork bill, as it's known for short, in Congress. <laughs> $787 billion worth of borrowed money to be spent on various pet projects of legislators. And finally, HASP, the Homeowner Affordability and Stability Plan, which channels about $270 billion worth uh, of taxpayers' money uh, to some homeowners in difficulty. Now, the net effect of all of these policies was revealed when the administration published its budget. $3.9 trillion worth of spending, $1.75 trillion worth of borrowing, simple arithmetic, the, the, the sort of thing that they do here at PricewaterhouseCoopers, reveals that 44% of spending in this coming year will be financed by borrowing, very close to half. The deficit will be 12.3% of gross domestic product, probably more because I think GDP will be lower than forecast. There hasn't been a deficit that size in the United States since World War II. In fact, the deficit is very close to being the same size in relation to GDP as it was uh, in the year after Pearl Harbor, 1942. We are having all the fiscal symptoms of a world war without the inconvenience of the war itself. I read the budget very closely. It projects, among other things, that the gross federal debt of the United States will rise from $10 trillion to $23 trillion over the next decade. In other words, from 70 to 100% of GDP. Although the budget's title was a new era of responsibility, in my view somewhat irresponsibly, the administration projects that the economy will grow next year by 3.2%, by 4% the year after that, by 4.6% in 2012, and by 4.2% in 2013. Ladies and gentlemen, if you believe that, you'll believe absolutely anything. <laughs> the big question from the foreign policy point of view is who pays? Who finances a deficit that large? A borrowing requirement that could in fact get as high as $2 trillion. At the height of the boom, as I already signaled, there was a very substantial flow of funds from the rest of the world, Asia and the petroleum exporting countries, to the United States. In fact, nearly half of all borrowing by US households and corporations in the boom years was financed from abroad. And a very important part of the financing uh, came from the People's Republic of China, and particularly from its central bank. Reserve accumulation by the Chinese was a critical part of the financing of America's borrowing habit during the good years. And a very important question indeed, I think you'll come to see, is whether the Chinese will continue to make that vast overdraft facility available to the United States. The problem is that the Chinese are rapidly slowing their accumulation of international reserves for the very simple reason that the principal source of reserve accumulation, their net exports, uh, is also contracting and contracting fast. Chinese reserves will almost certainly increase by somewhere in the region of $150 billion this year compared with more than $400 billion last year. It follows logically that they can't possibly have as much money available this year to lend to the United States as they did have last year. The full implications of that statement will become clear to you in a moment. Now, many of you are bored to death with the financial crisis, and I'm going to wake you up now by uh, exploring a theme that at the moment is almost wholly neglected uh, in the media. What are the geopolitical implications of this crisis. What does this actually mean for power? Now, some people argue that this implies, firstly, uh, an acceleration of the Asian catch-up, an acceleration of the advent of the Asian century, 
And other people argue that this crisis portends a final decline and fall of the US dollar as the international reserve currency. And you can see why people might make that argument. It seems obvious, doesn't it? This financial crisis has made in America stamped all over it. It is the American crisis, as surely as the crisis of 10, 11 years ago was the Asian crisis. And you would therefore expect that American, an American crisis would have some negative impact on the power of the United States. The German finance minister, Pierre Steinbrück, last year argued that this spelt the end of, quote, American financial superpower. But I want to suggest to you that this is completely wrong. Paradoxically, this financial crisis, though American in origin, is likely to increase the relative power of the United States. Think about that for a moment. If you were feeling sleepy, as some of you probably were, it's a cold day, we're now in a warm room, it's a natural thing to fall asleep, waken up, because I'm saying something deeply unusual and indeed counterintuitive. And I've come all the way from Boston, where it's even colder, to say it. <laughs> the fact is, ladies and gentlemen, that God watches over fools, drunks, and the United States. <laughs> and this is as true today as it was when that was first said a long time ago. Here's why. This crisis is having a disproportionately large impact on the rest of the world. It may have started here, but it's asymmetrical. It hurts others more. The impact on the crisis in terms of US growth is to reduce it from around 2% uh, two years ago to, as I said already, minus 1.6% this year, decline of 3.6% uh, in total. But the decline for China is a decline of more like 6.3%, from a growth rate of 13% when the world economy was moving at full tilt in 2007 to a growth rate this year that the IMF estimates will be 6.7%. Now, the differential is the key. If the US is slowed down by 3% or so, and China is slowed down by 6% or more, and this is in any sense continued over a period of time, then the rate at which China was catching up on the United States will also slow down. It was Goldman Sachs uh, who predicted only a couple of years ago that China's gross domestic product might equal that of the United States as soon as 2030, or perhaps even sooner. If, as I think uh, is likely, this crisis is going to reduce the growth rate of China by more than it reduces the growth rate of the United States, then that date will be significantly later than 2030, not sooner. The other point that may already have struck you about this crisis is that far from causing the decline of the dollar as an international reserve currency, it's had the very opposite effect. The dollar has rallied. And it rallied after the very worst moment in the financial crisis, the uh, Lehman Brothers bankruptcy of September the 15th last year. 9.15, now responsible for more financial damage than 9.11 was in 2001. Not only has the dollar rallied, but so have US Treasuries. Yields on 10-year uh, bonds at one point declined below 3%. This is not what you would expect if the financial crisis portended the end of American empire, the decline of the dollar, and the imminent insolvency of the United States government. Why? It's very simple. This is more than just a global financial crisis. This is a crisis of globalization. And the world is unfair. It turns out that others depend more on globalization than the United States, and they are hurting more as a result. That's partly because the United States turns out to retain its safe haven status. In a crisis, even a crisis that originates in the United States, investors around the world want to increase their holdings of dollar-denominated assets. That's the heart of the paradox. And one reason for that, and I think it'll become clear that it's a good reason, is that for all our troubles, we are a significantly more stable society 
with a significantly more stable political system than most of the rest of the world. It is a safe haven in the sense that the probability of there being blood in the streets, literally, after a financial crisis like this, is lower in the United States than it is in most other places. Because the US has a safe haven status, it has significantly more room for maneuver when it comes to counteracting the crisis. The US can borrow more at lower rates than everybody else. It's about to. In fact, we're going to see one of the most extraordinary uh, experiments in crowding out as the US floods the international bond market with up to $2 trillion of bonds and crowds out other sovereign borrowers who also want to run large deficits and also want to run large fiscal stimuluses. It's not fair because the US is a safe haven. It will make the most attractive offer to investors and others will be crowded out of the market. Another way of thinking about this is that if you look at the projections the IMF has just revised for growth in the year ahead, uh, the news is almost uniformly worse for the rest of the world than it is for the United States. So the US economy may contract by 1.6% this year, according to the IMF, but the Eurozone will co contract by 2%, Germany by 2.5%, the UK by 2.8%, Japan by 2.6%, and neighboring countries in Asia, the newly industrialized countries like Taiwan uh, and South Korea, will contract by something closer to 4%. The exception to the rule of worse performance includes China, which will continue to grow by more than 6%, the Middle Eastern economies, which the IMF forecasts will grow up close to 4%, and Russia, which will contract, but according to the IMF, by less than 1%. That's the catch, if you haven't already spotted it. The catch is that although the United States will do relatively well this year, its allies will do worse than its rivals. That's the catch. This crisis of globalization may be something that the United States can withstand relatively well, but it's an extremely painful and problematic crisis for key American allies, for Europe and for key Asian economies, notably Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea. In order to make ample room for discussion, I'm now going to say a few brief things about these other parts of the world, explaining why their predicament is in fact worse than ours. And then I'm going to reflect on whether the crises, particularly the European and Asian crises, create opportunities for our principal rivals, namely Russia and China, which, as I've said, will perform relatively well this year economically. That seems to me to be the central question to ask about the geopolitical consequences of the financial crisis, or as I would prefer to call it, of the crisis of globalization. You know, you think you have it bad here, in the sense that excessive household debt and a real estate bubble have suddenly brought chickens home to roost. But in other English-speaking countries, the problem is in fact worse. An obscure figure who shares an accent and nationality with me was in Washington DC today. <laughs> obscure because according to the radio this morning, no Americans have any idea at all that Gordon Brown is the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. <laughs> They are still under the uh, impression that it is the more glamorous Mr. Tony Blair. <laughs> Mr. Brown comes uh, from a country in far deeper trouble than the United States. Household debt reached a much higher proportion of GDP than it did here. The housing bubble inflated further. And the financial crisis uh, for London is a far more alarming one, even than it is for New York. Because New York's banks can turn to the whole of the United States and ask to be bailed out. Whereas Britain's banks can only turn to the whole of the United Kingdom. If they turn to the rest of the European Union, they are informed by someone probably speaking in a German accent that no bailout is available for non-Germans. You see, the key to understanding Europe's predicament is very simple. There may be a single currency, though Britain is not a part of it, 
but there certainly is no single treasury. There is no EU treasury that can pass uh, and implement a vast EU-wide stimulus package. The institution simply doesn't exist because the EU is a confederation, not a federation. That's one of the profound differences between it and the United States of America. So point one, the Anglosphere uh, contains at least two cases and possibly three of bigger problems than there are here. Now, at least one Canadian is sitting here tonight reflecting smugly that Canada alone among English-speaking countries stayed away from the toxic assets, avoided the perils of excessive bank leverage, and so on and so forth. And it's true that household debt did not explode in Canada. There wasn't much of a real estate bubble, and their banks were relatively prudently managed and regulated. However, it is, as I mentioned, a highly unfair world. Uh, and the latest news is that Ch uh, Canada's economy is now contracting faster than that of the United States which isn't entirely surprising when 85% of Canada's trade is with the United States. Point two, I want to tell you a tale of two Asias. The Asia that is traditionally closely aligned to the United States, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, is suffering a Great Depression. There can be no question that they are already in depression territory. Japan's exports declined by something like 27% uh, in the year ending last year, last December. Industrial output has contracted by 23% since September of last year. And the latest monthly trade figures are even worse. At the moment, Japan's exports are contracting at a fantastically rapid rate. And the impact on output is devastating. It's even worse in Taiwan and South Korea. The trade figures coming out of there suggest 40 to 45% declines in exports. 40 to 45% decline in exports is a very large number indeed for export-led economies. And remember, the Asian model of industrialization was predicated on exports. The collapse of world trade, which is at the heart of the crisis of globalization I described earlier to you, is a far worse story for these Asian economies than it is for the United States, which by comparison is much less export reliant than they are. The big, rapidly industrializing uh, giants of Asia, China and India, are by comparison less vulnerable. They have, although they're still nascent, engines of growth that are domestic rather than external. I just saw some very interesting figures from Goldman Sachs indicating that, yes, there has been a little bit, if not total, decoupling in the sense that there is some growth of consumption in China and India that is compensating uh, for the loss of export demand. So it's a tale of two Asias. And as I mentioned earlier, the Asias traditionally most closely aligned to the United States. These countries are suffering significantly more. Perhaps the most interesting story of our time, though, is the amazing centrifugal European Union. What is happening on the European continent at the moment is far more alarming than, is what, than what is happening in North America, and yet it is receiving barely any attention. Within that extraordinary confederation of 27 countries, there is amazing divergence between the borrowers and the savers, between the countries running enormous current account deficits during the boom and those that were running surpluses. Bulgaria, Greece, Romania, Portugal, all ended up with current account deficits in excess of 10% of gross domestic product, while Germany, Sweden, the Netherlands, and a couple of others were running surpluses. That is why some European countries are having crises, but not all European countries are having crises. There's a huge asymmetry within the European Union, and that is why the crisis is so profound for that institution. Secondly, European banks are highly geared, even by comparison with American banks. It's a dirty little secret that isn't often discussed, but even Germany's banks are more leveraged than American banks.
In fact, the leverage rates for, for a bank like Deutsche Bank are among the highest in the world. That's because most European countries had an even more liberal view of bank leverage than the United States did. The trouble is, once again, the variation. Some European countries have very large financial sectors. I already mentioned the United Kingdom in this connection. Belgium does too. So outside the EU does Switzerland. France and Denmark also have relatively highly leveraged uh, and large banks. But other countries are not in quite the same predicament. Point three, as has been pointed out by the IMF, European banks are moving much more slowly than American banks to acknowledge the losses that they've suffered, even although they're almost certainly on a similar scale to the losses suffered by US banks. The write-downs are something like half the write-downs that have been acknowledged here. There's a monetary strain going on inside this system. That's most obvious because not all members of the European Union are members of the single currency. Only 16 out of 27 EU member states are members of the Eurozone. The countries that aren't are more or less all experiencing currency crises. The countries within the Eurozone uh, that have deficit problems are experiencing another kind of crisis that manifests itself in the bond market, where the spreads of their bonds relative to German bonds have been exploding in recent weeks and months. Now, the really, really serious problem lies to the East. It's in Eastern Europe that a financial crisis is gathering momentum that has the potential to blow the European Union apart. And I do not say those words lightly. Countries like Poland, but even more so Hungary, and even more so the Baltic states, seized the good times with both hands and allowed very large external debts to build up in their private sectors. The characteristic phenomenon was the Hungarian household that took out a mortgage denominated in Swiss francs or in euros. The currency risk embedded in these transactions was vast, but it was simply ignored. Now, Nemesis is descending at a rapid rate on these countries. Their currencies are in free fall down by 20 or 30% relative to the euro and falling fast. The bonds of some East European countries, notably Latvia and Ukraine, are now already classified as junk. And crucially, even those countries in Eastern Europe like Ukraine that are not members of the EU have the potential to create trouble for the EU because most of the debt is owed to West European banks of something like $4.7 trillion worth of loans to East European economies run up in recent years, and that's a lot of money for relatively small economies, 75% has been provided by West European banks. That sucking sound you can hear is the sound of West European banks disappearing down an East European hole. And the first to go down will be Austria's. This is an, uneary, uh, an unearthly echo to the historian of the events of 1931, when the failure of the Credit Anstalt Bank signaled a major de uh, deterioration in international financial conditions and turned what up until that point was still not much more than a Great Recession into a full-blown Great Depression. We're used to reading about crises in the Greater Middle East, we're used to hearing about crises in Central Africa. Nothing new there. But crises in Eastern Europe, crises potentially in East Asia, these will make for altogether more surprising and unnerving reading. The Latvian government has already fallen in an Icelandic uh, comic opera sequence of events. More governments will fall. Ukraine, a deeply divided country, is approaching elections half in hock to the IMF, half holding out a begging bowl uh, to the Russians. There have been riots in the streets of Athens already. Expect more riots in other Balkan countries. Watch Bulgaria, watch Romania. And as the crisis worsens, so the division within Europe will widen. Already, just the other day, the German government rejected out of hand a Hungarian proposal for a generalized European bailout of Eastern Europe. Uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel said, Nein, 
at a summit that was also characterized by acrimonious exchanges between the French and Czech governments over alleged protectionism uh, by France towards its automobile industry. So the scenario that I want to suggest to you is that we are going to witness crises uh, in far off places of which we thought we knew a bit, in Eastern Europe particularly, but also I would imagine in some Asian countries that we don't think much about. And these crises will not only catch us off guard, but perhaps more importantly, they will create opportunities for America's most obvious strategic rivals in the world today. And by that I mean, first, Russia, which has a natural sphere of influence in Eastern Europe and indeed still regards the former Soviet republics there as the, quote, near abroad. And secondly, I have in mind China. Beware the bear in a bear market. Mr. Putin, the Tsar, or Prime Minister as he prefers to be known of Russia, <laughs> has already made a number of extremely interesting moves with respect uh, to the so-called near abroad. Among them, the threat to rid Ukraine, I quote, of all sorts of swindlers and bribe takers. The signature of a, an air defense treaty with Belarus was obviously designed to counteract the American scheme uh, for missile defenses in Eastern Europe. Uh, the deal with Kyrgyzstan to kick the United States out of the Manas air base is of a piece with this strategy, as is uh, the creation of uh, air bases and naval bases in Abkhazia, the breakaway Georgian province that the Russians alone recognize as an independent state. I want to quote to you an extract from Mr. Putin's recent speech at the Davos World Economic Forum. The unipolar pattern of the world economy that is completely outdated by now must be replaced by a new system based on cooperation of several big centers. That's his pitch for more power. But listen to this. Let us be frank. You should always be very nervous when Mr. Putin says, let us be frank. <laughs> Provoking military political instability and other regional conflicts is also a convenient way of deflecting people's attention from mounting social and economic problems. Regrettably, further attempts of this kind cannot be ruled out. Think about that. What Mr. Putin is doing there is, it seems to me, issuing an implicit threat. That the more unstable the world becomes, the more likely it is that some countries will embark on aggressive foreign policies to try to legitimize and stabilize their domestic positions. Now, he didn't necessarily have himself in mind when he said those words, but it doesn't take an enormous leap of inference to see that it could apply very well to Russia itself. Of course, he may be bluffing. With oil at $42 a barrel, Russia does not look ready to invade another neighboring state the way it invaded Georgia last year. But we need to watch out. The other issue, and this is really my final point, and the one that in many ways I take more seriously, has to do with China and how it reacts to new opportunities created by the crisis uh, in East Asia. In a rather more polite speech at Davos, Wen Jibao said as follows, and I quote, it is necessary to increase the voice and representation of developing countries in international financial organizations and actively fulfill its role in the maintenance of international and regional financial stability. His pitch for more power. Expect more of this at the G20, by the way, in London next month. But here was a more significant thing that he said after Davos. Whether China will continue to buy US bonds and how much to buy should be in accordance with China's needs and depend on the safety and protection of value of foreign exchange. There's an implicit threat there too, though it's a more subtle one than Mr. Putin's threat of military action in response to an economic crisis. Could the Chinese use our reliance on their reserve accumulation as a lever? And if so, when will they use it? Or is he bluffing too? I think he may be. 
I can't resist drawing your attention to a quotation that appeared in the Financial Times just a few days ago from Liu Ping, who's Director General at the China Banking Regulatory Commission. Except for US Treasuries, he asked, what can you hold? US Treasuries are the safe haven. For everyone, including China, it's the only option. We hate you guys. He speaks uh, English with a tremendously colloquial turn. We hate you guys. Once you start issuing $1 trillion to $2 trillion, we know the dollar's going to depreciate, so we hate you guys, but there's nothing much we can do. When you reflect on it, it turns out that both the Russians and the Chinese have been weakened more by this crisis than the United States, and they know it. These speeches at Davos, which so impressed the media, were both, it seems to me, in large measure bluff. That's why we should resist the temptation, ladies and gentlemen, to regard this financial crisis as in some sense the end of the American century, or much less the end of the dollar. I think the United States is actually in a stronger position than we think it is because of the asymmetric impact of the global financial crisis, or rather, the, global, uh, the crisis of globalization. The only catch is that this crisis is hitting America's allies, particularly in Europe and Asia, rather harder than it's hitting our rivals. And this may well encourage tougher rhetoric from both, Ru both Russia and China. But my concluding line is that we should not be intimidated by this rhetoric. The United States needs to take a firm line when they try it on. We mustn't, in short, confuse a great recession with the kind of recessional that Rudyard Kipling once, uh, once sensed faced the British Empire. You'll remember those lines. Far cold, our navies melt away. Or June and headland sinks the fire. Lo, all our pomp of yesteryear is one with Nineveh and Tyre. The good news, ladies and gentlemen, is that the American empire is not yet one with Nineveh and Tyre. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I spoke for rather longer than I'd intended, but uh, we have 20 minutes in which you can ask me difficult questions. Uh, there is a microphone, uh, and uh, it will be presented to you uh, if you raise your hand with sufficient vigor. Uh, there's a lady on the edge there, Takoko, who's very near to you, so why don't we start with her? Hi, I'm just wondering if we are um, possibly going to go into a treasury bubble since so many are buying treasuries. And I was also thinking <coughs> that once we stabilize the financial markets and um, the housing market, if it's possible if we lower our small business taxes to maybe 14%, like they have in Ireland, where it will even out, or lower our, um, our capital gains, maybe not to zero, which China has, but somewhat close to that, so we can gain back the 20 to 40% decline that we've already lost. Those are two part questions. Sure. Well, the Treasury bubble argument looked quite powerful when yields went down below 3% on the 10-year and there was a huge flight uh, of, of capital into those securities. If anything, it was even more pronounced at the short end of the curve. But I'm not sure a bubble is quite the right term. That, that would imply a complete misalignment between those rates and uh, the potential for deflation that is still very much there in the economy. I'm not at all convinced that we'll see an enormous uh, bounce back uh, which would happen if the bubble quote-unquote burst. I'm not sure that rates are going to zoom up at any point soon, unless, of course, there's a radical shift in expectations abroad and at home about what the Fed is doing. Now, the Fed said that it would start buying treasuries at some point. In other words, that it would start literally printing money, financing the U.S. deficit simply by buying treasuries uh, from the Treasury. It hasn't done that yet. Uh, and it's not quite clear what the response will be when it does. There's going to be a tug of war between inflationary expectations on one side and deflationary expectations on the other. And at the moment, my sense is that the deflationary expectations are going to carry on winning. 
that it's going to be a while before people start to move out of the treasuries market in really significant numbers. Because what other assets look attractive? There's so much risk still of further declines in the equity market that I'm not sure anybody is going to want to exit the bond market anytime soon. And the appetite for liquidity is so high uh, that they're going to be crowding around relatively short maturities too. So I'm not convinced this is, in fact, a bond market bubble. I think this is a rational response to a global deflationary crisis. Uh, and it may take some time for there to be a return uh, to higher yields. Your second question about taxation brings us back to the budget. Uh, the long-term trend, according to the budget, uh, is for taxation to rise, uh, and particularly the taxation of the relatively well-off in this country to rise. But not just the well-off. If you look at the numbers for direct taxation, there is a clear upward trend after the two-year period that we're heading towards. After the, uh, the, the, the budget forecasts the end of this recession, the trend will be for tax to rise. And as I said earlier, the assumption the administration is making is that this will all be over by the end of this year and that we'll be back to robust growth next year. That seems to me a highly questionable assumption. And that is why this prospect of tax increases is such a dangerous one uh, to raise at this point. I can see why they've done it. Over the long term, there's a major fiscal problem that would be here anyway, even if there was no financial crisis, because of the costs uh, of Medicare and Social Security as the baby boomers retire. But right now, in the face of this uh, really huge early 1930s-style financial crisis, uh, it is a risk to start talking about uh, tax rises. I'm not sure it'll be uh, any time soon that we see Irish-style uh, tax reform in this country, though. Don't, don't hold your breath for that. A gentleman over here um, is as far away from the microphone as he could be, but you look young and fit. You'll get this. Thank <laughs> Thanks very much. Describe this as a, as a crisis of globalization. What uh, structural reforms do you anticipate uh, emerging to prevent a recurrence of this? And do you think that there's any sort of transnational regulatory system that has a chance of working? Well, one of the things that's really most alarming about the crisis of uh, globalization is that it's extremely hard to arrest once it's begun. Some years ago, I wrote a piece for Foreign Affairs entitled Sinking Globalization, in which I made the argument that, that history suggested globalization could be unraveled very quickly, it took a while to develop, took decades, in fact, for us to reduce trade barriers and reduce restrictions and capital flows and reduce migration. But as became clear in 1914, globalization can be ended almost overnight if there's a major geopolitical shock. Well, we don't have that geopolitical shock yet, but we are seeing extraordinarily rapid declines in global trade and indeed in capital flows. And I'm not sure how easy this will be to reverse. You see, it's easy now, after the fact, to talk about creating a world finance organization with powers commensurate with those of the World Trade Organization, the power to uh, insist on better banking supervision, the power to insist that imbalances be reduced, the power to complain when countries manipulate their currencies. But it's too late now. Setting it up now is, is, is literally uh, shutting the stable door after the horse is bolted. And we could devote a great deal of energy to regulating global financial markets over the years to come and not have any global financial markets to regulate. That is the classic tragedy of regulation, which I, I talk about a little bit in The Ascent of Money. The regulators are always fighting the last crisis. The regulations are always introduced after the fact rather than before the crisis when they're really needed. Uh, let, let me take a question from the front row, I'm trying to be even-handed here. Yes, madam. Would you please address the issues, uh, geopolitical issues, for implications for Latin America? Uh, My sincere hope for Latin America is that for a period of perhaps three decades, the United States does not have a policy towards the region. <laughs> because for most of the past hundred years, more or less every time the United States has had a policy towards Latin America, the outcome has been negative rather than positive. And so I advocate no foreign policy 
on the part of the United States for Latin America. Uh, and I advocate also that Latin America focus uh, on reforming its institutions, uh, not to appease the International Monetary Fund, but because the institutions need reform. As it happens, I spent part of this morning at Harvard Business School discussing the situation of the Brazilian economy, often grouped together with India and China as one of the BRICs. But the reality is that Brazil's performance compared with that of India and China, and even compared with that of Russia, has been pretty miserable. Per capita growth rate has been consistently lower than that of these other big countries, and the reason's fairly clear to see. Although there's been much talk of reform, uh, in reality, Lula has not radically altered uh, the structures of the Brazilian economy. It's still incredibly hard to start a business in Brazil, to fire somebody in Brazil. Even to get a property contract to go through is about as hard in Brazil as it is in India. So Brazil, although in many ways it's been the poster child for Latin America over the past 10 years or so, has a hugely long way to go. Uh, unfortunately, it's going to be harder to make these reforms now that the crisis of globalization is upon us. Much of Brazil's best uh, performance in the last few years was the result of what one Brazilian official described to my colleague Aldo Masacchio as the hand of God, by which he meant Chinese demand for Brazilian commodities. Now that demand is bound to be diminished by the crisis of globalization. And so the good times are bound to be over uh, for Brazil's crucial agricultural sector. Chile, too, will suffer from a <coughs> drastic decline in commodity prices. This is the story of, of crises of globalization for Latin America and indeed for some African countries. If the commodities bubble, to go back to the point about bubbles, is well and truly over, which it is, it's going to be much, much harder for these commodity exporters to sustain growth. So for me, the story in Latin America is about institutional reform, about resisting those old siren voices calling for increased state control, calling, uh, as in the case of Chavez's Venezuela, for a return to some kind of uh, Castro-like model of nationalism plus socialism. That's a toxic combination. Uh, and one of the few consoling things about this crisis is that if nothing else, it's taken the wind out of Mr. Chavez's sails uh, by taking the price of oil well below the tolerance threshold for his, uh, his various schemes. I'll swing now to this side of the room and um, can't go straight to the front row without sh seeming to be frontist. So <laughs> I'll take a question uh, from the gentleman in the third row there. Takako, can you yeah, pass the microphone along? Thank you very much. Yes, sir. I'm not entirely clear where you come out on the economy of Russia as to whether it is going to be worse off in the next, say, five years than we are or better. Uh, <clears throat> could you restate it? Yeah. That's a great question because the International Monetary Fund is relatively optimistic, and I am rather more pessimistic. Uh, the IMF's projection, as I said, for Russia's growth this year is that it'll be minus 0.7%, which is really not bad. I can't believe that's right because of Russia's enormous dependence on exports of, of oil and natural gas and the dramatic decline in the prices of those commodities. Uh, my sense is that Russia will probably suffer rather more. And the fact that the ruble is one of the currencies that's already in freefall tends to support that, that point. If the Russians carry on intervening uh, to support the ruble and the uh, scale that they have done in the last month or so, they'll be all out of uh, hard currency in less than two years. So their position is, I think, a good deal weaker than the IMF uh, survey suggests. And that brings me back to Mr. Putin's quote about what crises might do to a country's foreign policy. One of the one of the points I often try to drum home to students is that it's when countries are weak that they're most likely to act aggressively, not when they're strong. It's when they feel insecure that they take risks in foreign policy. It wasn't out of a sense of security that Germany's leaders elected to go to war in 1914, but out of a sense that their position was steadily deteriorating. Uh, in the same way, Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor was born of a sense of weakness, not strength. Uh, 
And what worries me most about Russia is not its relative strength, but actually the sense of weakness that they must now feel. You know, however things turn out, even if the IMF is right, which I suppose it's possible it might be, <laughs> it has to occasionally be right, uh, the feeling in Moscow must be one of insecurity. They have a theory about Russian power which is super simple, and it's based on the experience of the last 40 years. And the theory goes like this. When the price of oil is high, the Russian state is stable. And when it is low, the Russian state is weak. There's a wonderful book by Stephen Kotkin, which I recommend, called Armageddon Averted, which makes the point that had it not been for the oil price spikes of the 1970s, the wheels would have come off the Soviet economy 10 years before 1989-91. Uh, equally, if you look at the 1990s, what really made the whole experiment with democratization under Yeltsin fail was that it coincided with very low oil prices, uh, which brought the central government to the brink of insolvency in 98, in fact, over the brink, into default. So Mr. Putin's theory must be the lower it goes, the lower it goes, uh, uh, that is the price of oil, the weaker Russia is. And what can he do about that? The only thing you can do if your revenues are heavily dependent on the price of oil and global demand is collapsing is to try to increase the risk premium. And the way you do that uh, is by making trouble. And one of the best places to make trouble is Iran. So it's all very well for President Obama to write secret letters to Mr. Medvedev saying, please, can you help us deal with these Iranians? But the Russians have absolutely no incentive to help deal with the Iranian nuclear program. They have every incentive to encourage the Iranians to push them towards the brink. The Russians would be delighted. They would like nothing more, ladies and gentlemen, than for Israel to attack Iran because Iran's nuclear program is a day away from being uh, complete. That would make Mr. Putin's day. Because apart from anything else, for all the other consequences, I'll leave all the other consequences aside, the effect would be to send the price of oil through the roof. So there's an obvious problem that Russia presents. The weaker they feel, the riskier their policy, because they stand to gain from higher political risk. And that seems to me the best way of understanding uh, how Russia will behave. Uh, let me take a question from the front row, and then I must take some from the very back. And then I must go to this side. We have time, I think, for two or three more questions. Would you agree? Yes, please. And um, what danger is there in China of a revolt since the people came in from the farms to work in the factories, and now they're back on the farms again? One of the big worries uh, in Beijing is clearly that a crisis of globalization will be a crisis of social order in China. And the return of 20 million migrant workers to closed factories after the Chinese New Year uh, was an extremely alarming development. The authorities, I think for that reason, are clinging to what I call Chimerica, the relationship between China and America. They do not want that to break down. That's why they reverted to the dollar peg, intervening again to stabilize the dollar uh, yuan uh, exchange rate. That's why when, uh, when uh, Secretary Clinton was in China, <coughs> the rhetoric was highly conciliatory. Uh, it seems to me they are worried. They're much more worried than we are because we don't really have to anticipate a full-scale breakdown in social order. Sending people back to the countryside is, of course, the right response because revolutions <coughs> tend to happen in cities uh, rather than in the country. But it's going to be hard. Uh, this is going to get worse for China than anybody realizes. Uh, Wen Jiabao's confident assertions at Davos about growth this year, I think, will be belied by events. Decoupling hasn't happened in the way that the optimists said. China turns out to still be highly reliant on Western export demand, and that demand is collapsing. So it's going to be extremely interesting. And I don't know, I'm not sure anybody knows, whether China can navigate its way through a recession without a breakdown in order. The only thing I do know is that the Putin principle applies to China too. When things go wrong, if your legitimacy was primarily based on prosperity, you need to der derive your legitimacy from some other source. And we know that one of the characteristic features of Chinese culture today is the very vibrant nationalism. It was there when the Western media covered Tibet unfavorably 
towards uh, China. It was there when the earthquake struck, and it was there during the Olympics. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if the regime faced with social disorder resorted to nationalism to try to stabilize its position. Uh, that, of course, leaves open the question what crisis might allow them to do that. But I leave that, I think, to your imaginations. Let me take a question from uh, the back. There's a gentleman sitting right at the edge there, Takoko, which thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you. Uh, to your point on the uh, modest increase in consumption in China, yes, uh, but um, a, a declining portion of that is attributable to consumer consumption. Based on the data I've seen, the consumer consumption is down to about 30% of the total, which in my view reflects the widespread ability of Asian governments to, to pursue capacity investment, in this case excess capacity investment on the one hand, but their inability to create truly consumer-driven um, investment. And, and so um, does it follow from that, in your view, that real recovery is going to be dependent again, as it was previously, on the return of the U.S. consumer? And, and, and if that's true, are we really in for a long recession? I, mean, I don't see any signs that the U.S. consumer is about to spend again in the pattern that they did until a year ago. Thank you. Well, there's no question that the default setting for China is not to increase uh, household consumption, it's to increase investment in infrastructure. Uh, and if you look at what they're doing with their stimulus package, a huge part of it is yet more highways, bridges, light railways. And they don't really seem to me fully to get it, that they've got to try and create incentives for ordinary uh, lower middle class and middle class Chinese to consume more. They need to build some kind of meaningful welfare net so that the savings, household savings rate starts to come down. And this doesn't seem to be happening anything like fast enough. That leaves, as you rightly said, not just the US consumer, but the Western consumer, let's say, uh, particularly the English-speaking consumer. And I agree with you. Uh, they're not coming back to the shopping malls anytime soon. And the reason is clear. If you subtract the effect of mortgage equity withdrawal from US growth in the Bush years, just take that out. The growth rate would actually have been 1% per annum on average. That's how dependent American consumption had become on, on leverage, on the ability to borrow and turn the house into an ATM. Now, we just can't go back to that. That, that system's over. The age of leverage is dead. And that's why it seems to me perfectly reasonable, as I argued in this weekend's New York Times, to anticipate a protracted, maybe even 10-year period of significantly lower growth. I think the average growth rate will be closer to 1%, which is why I think the budget forecasts for growth are so risible. 4% per annum growth in your dreams. It ain't going to happen. And that means the kind of lost decade that Japan experienced in the 1990s for the entire world economy. I hate to end on a gloomy note, but I noticed that it's 7 o'clock, and I promised I'd shut up by then. Uh, forgive me if I didn't have time. Thank you. Thank you.